Amen. Oh, it is nice how long it takes for all the kids to clear out. That means we have a good, healthy amount of children here. They are working hard. They're getting ready. Two more weeks. Two more weeks of prep time. And then uh, and you will see one of the most fun, organized chaos services we do here at the Star. <laughs> it is fun. It is fun. So... It's, boy, it does get real quiet when they leave, doesn't it? You know, it is one of, I just want to take a second and enjoy that. Uh, actually, speaking of, I don't get too many quiet moments at my house. Right now, being summer, it's nice because it's, it's August, so I'm actually um, really, really looking forward to three weeks from now when my kids go back to school. And it's not, it's not that I don't enjoy them. But I'll leave it at that. I now, I'll just say, I will say, I understand now why my mother and father would say, can't wait for you to go back to school. <laughs> I don't know if that ever came out, but, you know, I'm just saying. And it's not, it's out of, it's out of pure love. It, it is true. It's, it's the truth. But, you, all right, just like when we were growing up, my house is kind of a hub for all the neighborhood kids. It's every, everybody, everybody comes to my house to play. And it might be because... Half the neighborhood kids actually live in my house. But, you know, so you know, I kind of get that. You know, they all go back to school, and it's just, there's always a lot going on. But one of my favorite things <laughs> is watching these, 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 you know, 10, 13-year-old kids figure out all the different plans and ideas that they could come up with over the summer. And whenever we're, you know, my, my three favorites so far this summer has been they wanted to build a fort, uh, they even had the schematics and everything. They drew it all up. Uh, they wanted to build a gaming room. And my personal favorite was they wanted to take one of their little electric scooter bike things and take some wood and build a cart around it and a couple of seats so they can drive right up and down the road and pick each other up and bring them back to my house. It was like a little chauffeur service, I guess, they were going to do. But just like every one of those plans I just named to you, they all seem to come to a screeching halt once I let them know that they're actually going to have to do something for that, right? They're actually going to have to put in some work. Like, I'm not going to do all this, and then you guys destroy it, which seems to happen. But, you know, it, it's, it's interesting to watch them get all worked up, all excited, just to watch their plans go nowhere. <laughs> I mean, they, they will spend an entire day on a plan and an idea, and, uh, yeah, and it just seems to be gone. And whenever, you, whenever we watch kids, it's, it's funny to watch them and think, how do we do this? Do we, do we ever interact like this? I mean, you know, we watch children. Sometimes we admire their, their freedom and their, you know, their, their, uh, they're not worried about anything at all. Sometimes we got, have we grown out of that? Have we grown out of some of the childish ways? And, I, and my mind goes to, this is an election year. I think that's a fantastic example. How many times... Every single election year, hear a politician get up, and they say, what are you going to do? I have a plan. I have a plan. And I, I love it to watch whenever people push back, whether it's their opponent or, you know, someone interviewing them. And they'll say, okay, well, what is your plan? I have a three-step plan. Okay, what's step one? Step one will lead to step two and three, and it will be great. They never, ever tell you the plan. They never actually get to it. Right, and it's just—it's really funny to watch, and you know, the 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 most amazing thing about it to me is sometimes people go, "Hmm, he responded really well to that. That was really good. He's got my vote. He's got a plan," and they're impressed with something that we have no idea what they're about to do. And of course, then the next part is that's in the natural realm. But what about in the body of Messiah? Does that type of mindset and that type of uh, tolerance does that have any place? in the body of Messiah. Proverbs 25, 14 says this, like clouds and wind that bring no rain is he who boasts about a gift they never give. Now, all right, someone might be wondering, what does this guy have against plans? And nothing. I Actually, I am quite, sometimes you can ask my wife, I am a planner. In a lot of ways, I have an I, it's like I have an idea. Let's let's do these things. It's, I'm not as bad as some 
uh, people that I would go to, you know, Cedar Point with and stuff, some friends we would have, they would have the entire itinerary picked out. Okay, we're going to hit this ride at this time. This time we're going to be here. We'll all meet back for lunch. I don't do all of that, but my job, my career is all about planning. I deal with nothing but logistics and uh, coordination and scheduling. And I even tell the guys who look at my schedule, I said, listen, <laughs> I use my favorite word. That schedule is tentative. Okay? <laughs> it's, it's, it is subject to change, right? But my entire, that's, that's what I do every single day, is I deal with, with planning. And so I, I don't have anything against plans, but I try to think of it this way. Uh, the way that, that the scripture says, says, the person may plan his path, but Adonai directs his step. And I just will tell you from personal experience, you may have an idea or we may come up with an idea and a plan, but God's ways will always, always prevail, even if it means we have to go through some very difficult times. That was an amen. So, again, so again, just I'm, I'm trying to just make sure everyone understands I don't have anything against the plan. Uh, I mean, there's definitely nothing wrong with a good plan. Matter of fact, but Psalms chapter 40, verse 6 says, Many things you have done, Adonai, my God. Your plans for us are wonderful. There is none to be compared to you. If I were to speak and tell of them, they would be too many to count. Amen. Now, what's, what's interesting about this verse uh, to me is that he starts off talking about the things that God has done. Okay? And, he's, and this is the thing that he is praising him for first. Many things you have done. And then he goes and he talks about your plans. Or he talks about the plans of God. And that's, that's what he's impressed with, with God the most, is the fact that God has done things. Think about this. If, what if God would have said, All right, I'm going to take care of you guys. And that's it. He never, nothing ever happened over the last 6,000 years. In all reality, we could be honest, it would be a little bit more difficult to, to trust him. Right? We're like, wait a minute, well, where has he been for the last 6,000 years? Right? But the reason we have the confidence in God, as the scripture teaches us, is because he is faithful. He's proven himself to be faithful. He's done what he said he is going to do. He, we, we all have testimonies in this room of things that God has done. We are all sitting here together because God said he's going to redeem, his, redeem mankind, and he did just that. Right? So that is, what, that is where our hope is. So that's, where, that's why we know all the other promises that God says, and we talk about you know, eschatology and uh, you know, end times. All right, well, this is, we, we know God is going to do that. We don't doubt him at all. The thing is, sometimes we tend to get this a little backwards with us. And you know, we want people to be impressed with our plans before we have proven ourselves by our actions. You know, how can people trust our plans if they cannot trust our reliability. So, again, I just want to preface this with all, you know, it's okay to plan, right? I'm going to, and, and it's okay. Uh, you know, there's a lot to be said about this topic, and with our Torah portion and, and vowels and oaths, and, and there's, there's a lot to get into and break down, but uh, I believe the Holy Spirit wants to hone in on a very specific point this morning. So this word plan that was used in Psalms, is the Hebrew word chashab, which, according to Strong's, and the definition is generally, this root signifies or signifies a mental process whereby some course is planned or conceived. It means, among other things, to think, devise, or plan. So essentially, it, it's a thought or an idea, right? A plan. That's what it is. It's, it's in your head. Uh, it could be for either good or evil. However, this is, where we, this is where it gets a little dangerous for us. If it stays up here, that's, that's, that's okay. But once we verbally express this idea, this plan, this thought, uh, in a way that signifies that uh, we are going to be doing something or something we are going to do, then it becomes what our Torah portion was talking about, a vow or an oath. And that's when it can become dangerous. Matter of fact, it becomes sinful if we do not complete our vows quickly. As we learn in Deuteronomy chapter 23, says when, uh, verse 22, it says, When you make a vow to Adonai your God, you are not to delay to make good on it. For Adonai your God will certainly uh, require it of you, and you would have 
sin on you. But if you refrain from making a vow, you would not have sin on you. Whatever comes out of your lips, you are to take care to do, since you have vowed to Adonai your God, a free will offering that you have promised with your mouth. That sounds a lot like what Yeshua said in Matthew 15, 11, What makes a person unclean is not what goes into his mouth. Rather, what comes out of his mouth, this is what makes him unclean. So there's a warning, clear warning here in Scripture that that I think sometimes we might overlook. I think sometimes we just got too comfortable with expressing our thoughts. I'm not a big fan of social media. I know. I I don't knock anybody who's on it, but I don't like the bad side of it. There's a lot of good on there. I can keep up with my cousins around the country, but um, I just don't, the the idea that you just express every single thing, it's like people get in the habit now of just putting out whatever comes on, whatever comes to their mind immediately. And that's a dangerous thing to do. There's a reason why God does not allow us to read each other's minds, okay? (laughs) It's like, you don't want to know We'd probably get a little depressed and a little scared. We would never leave our homes. There, there's a reason this, things just stay up here. I, I say it this way. God gave us two eyes, two ears, and only one mouth. That means we should be doing at least twice as much watching and listening than we do speaking. The Bible is very clear about that. The Bible actually, I think, backs that up. It says we should be slow to anger, quick to listen. So it tells us to be slow twice as much as we are quick to do something. So... All right, this word that was used in Deuteronomy for promise was also used in our portion. Uh, It is the Hebrew word nadar, which simply means to promise. In context there, it means to do or give something to God. But in all reality, the, the, the word means promise. Now, according to Webster's, a promise, which is the word that we use in English for this Hebrew word, it is a declaration that one will do or refrain from uh or refrain from doing something specific. That, in other words, we'll do something or we will not do something. That's what a promise. It's a declaration of that. Now, it, it's, all right, stick with me for a second on this one. I, it's, I don't know. I'm not a scholar. But this might be one of the only or the only example in the scriptures where we can create our own sin scenario. I'll think about this for a minute. If someone says... If someone fornicates or they take an innocent life, that's pretty cut and dry, right? It, it's, it's pretty much, that's an inherently bad thing to do. You can't say, well, there's the circumstances. You get it, you know. Of course I fornicated. There's, there's nothing that you can excuse from that. It was a wrong thing to do, no matter what. It's inherently bad. Then there are other things that are inherently good. For example, if we are walking and someone comes in here, we'll keep it within the family here, say, all right, I'll, I'll help clean the oneg, or I want to, you know, do something in the congregation or help a fellow congregant. Those are good things. The Bible encourages us to help each other and to be there and to do good things, right? So there's nothing inherently bad about those things that I just mentioned. However, if you say, I'm going to do that, I'm going to help you, I'm going to take care of this, and then you don't do it. You've now created a sin scenario for yourself. Amen. It's very interesting. And again, I think we have forgotten that in the body. You know, I, I say this, uh, just do it, right? Like the old Nike, all right? Just do it. If you, if you, the Bible says, uh, whenever you have an opportunity, let us do good toward all. It doesn't say, let us tell each other we'll do good. It says, just do it. And Proverbs, I believe it's the proverb for today, chapter three, where it talks about if you see something good to do, then just go ahead and do it. Don't say to your neighbor, I'll do that tomorrow when it's within your power to do it right now. That's what he's, that's what he's talking about. So to just do it, not prefacing our intentions with words. Doesn't mean, again, that I'm against volunteer sheets, okay? I think, I think it's good to, to volunteer and do things. But again, we have to be careful with our words. Why? Because if we don't hold on to our vows quickly, that means we vowed something that we either weren't prepared or willing to do, or we just simply weren't able to do it for whatever reason. So either we weren't 
prepared to do it or we just weren't willing to do it. And no matter how we shake it up, it, that, that's how it always falls. Our hearts can be very deceitful. We know that from Jeremiah. So again, it's very dangerous to voice our ideas and our thoughts quickly. Have you ever been in conversations with someone and all they did was just tell you every single thought that came to their head? And the conversation really didn't go well or in any specific direction because every time they had an opportunity, they told you what they thought. They told you what their idea for that was or is. So there's a reason why that bothers us. All right, so, so with this, we have to be thinking, what are our motivations in our thought process? What are our motivations for saying these things? Are we just vowing to do something for, or, or planning to do something for selfish gain? You know, sometimes it could, you know, we could want to be impressive to people. It's, it's, you know, especially if you're new in a group or something. You want to impress the people around you. But uh, so sometimes we'll just, we'll say things. We'll talk too much. We'll say too much. And all of a sudden we find ourselves in a certain spot where now someone's counting on us for something. Because we talked ourselves into, oh, well, sin, basically a sin scenario at that point. If I don't do this, okay, now I'm kind of caught. You know, getting your foot caught in your mouth. It doesn't always have to be something that drastic, though. I mean, it, it could be just simply we commit to something before we really know what it entails or what, what, what is expected of us. You know, sometimes we feel pressured. And you know, we have the, the youth, <laughs> this kid takeover coming up, and we always have kids coming in and visiting, always families coming in and visiting. And sometimes the temptation is, oh, we got new kids. Let's get you involved. You can commit to be here. I know this is your first time. Welcome, but we have a service coming up that we want to throw your kids front and center. Uh, <laughs> that's why sometimes I'm like, let's just, let's just slow down. Let's just see how, you know, the kids do. And, you know, let's just, before we ask them to commit to anything, you know, we don't want to set them up for any failure. So uh, I like how uh, the scriptures say, uh, oh, what's that verse? How's it go? Uh, if you answer someone before hearing them out, that's both stupid and embarrassing. To answer someone is literally what it says. To answer someone before hearing them out is both stupid and embarrassing. So we have to... <laughs> Let's, let's let people finish and know before we commit to something, before we make a vow. So our portion this week starts off telling us how Hashem, I think, how he, how he feels about vows. You know, at the end of the day, he, he, very, he warns us to be careful with vows. We can't say, God knew what I meant. That's not, that's not a get-out-of-jail-free card with, with the vows, okay? God said, don't say it, but if you do, you're held accountable. But that's what I mean. We, we hear that a lot. You know, well, God knows what I meant. You knew what I meant. You knew I couldn't do this. You knew that it wasn't going to really work out. You know me. I just say things. Well, according to God's word, that's not good. Okay, so what, what there's a couple questions. I talk to my brother a lot, and uh, he, <laughs> my brother likes to argue, okay, I'm the nice brother, uh, and you'll, you'll, never, you'll never hear, uh, hear an argument about that. Just don't ask my sister. But whenever my, whenever my, uh, my brother, I talk to him, he always, always has something to fire back with. He likes to just argue. So I try to think, what would David say? Okay? <laughs> and when you go and you read this, uh, someone could ask, well, what if I don't actually say I promise or I swear to this? I just say it. Do I... That, I'm off the hook, right? That's not, that's not the same thing. Well, I want to look at an example in the Tanakh. Now, probably one of the greatest examples of a vow that completely backfired was in uh, Judges chapter 11. This is uh, the account of Jephthah. He was a judge of Israel. And at this time, Israel, uh, well, a little background. Jephthah, he, had, um, he was an outcast. He was an illegitimate son, basically, of his father. And so he was... He was ostracized. He was kind of kicked out. But then his family got in trouble, so they went back and got him. And they said, we need your help. And if you help us with this, and then we'll, let, we'll make you the head of our father's home. So he had a lot riding on this. And the enemy that he had to go fight, the enemy was accusing Israel of stealing their land. We haven't heard that before. And so now this, this is what he was up against. So in verse 30 and 31 of chapter 11, uh, it says, Then Jephthah vowed a vow to Adonai and said, 
If you will indeed give the children of Ammon into my hand, then it will be that whatever comes out of the doors of my house to meet me when I return safely from the children of Ammon, it will be Adonai's, and I will offer it up as a burnt offering. So just to reiterate, he's saying, God, if you give me this victory, when I go home, whatever walks out of the doors of my house when I get back, I will go ahead and sacrifice that to you. Not a good plan, I would say. That's probably not a good idea. So what happens? Uh, Well, first off, notice here that he did not say, I vow, I promise, I swear. He didn't actually say that. It says that he vowed a vow, but those words never came out of his mouth. He just said to Adonai what he was going to do. What happened? Well, Long story short, he gets the victory, goes back home. First person to walk out of his house was his daughter. Not just his daughter, but his only child. And he went through with it. He went through with it like he said he would. Now, a lot of people, in in verse 35, I mean, it tore him up. Don't get me wrong. It's not like it was just nonchalant. Like, okay, cool, let's go. He, He was pretty upset. He said, I have opened my mouth to Adonai, and I cannot take it back. Just him again speaking the words was enough to hold him to the standard of the vow. Now, the question is, could Jephthah have reneged on this vow, right? Could he have just said, okay, wait a minute, this isn't right? And this has been discussed, obviously, for generations. And I think uh, a good summary of this, of what, you know, the consensus is, is from, uh, from a commentary that we find for our week's portion in Numbers chapter 30, verse, verse 2. And again, I'll read that scripture And it says, when a man makes a vow to Adonai or formally obligates himself by swearing an oath, he is not to break his word, but is to do everything he said he would do. Okay, according to uh, Matthew Henry's commentary, which I'm not uh, the biggest fan of this commentary, but I think this one hits the nail on the head. It says, no man can be bound by his own promise to do what he is already by divine precept forbidden to do. In other matters, the command is that he shall not break his words, though he may change his mind. So he said, I'm going to sacrifice whoever comes out. There is nothing in the Torah that has anything to do with human sacrifices. Okay? Matter of fact, God, any, anyone that he saw doing that, God basically, you know, destroyed them. Right? That was, it was not a good thing. And, and again, there were very specific animals and things like that that were allowed to be sacrificed, not people. So God already uh, decreed that that's not supposed to happen. So, but now he finds himself in this strange scenario, like, okay, I swore this to God, but he also told us not to do this. Now, Jephthah was by no means a scholar, okay? <laughs> that wasn't, he, was a, he was a warrior. He really didn't know what was in there, which I think is why he went through it. But to kind of bring this to us, uh, all right, we have how many... We all have kids, or most of us have kids, I'm sure. Uh, Or just think of a child or a close family member, could be a parent, sibling, or something. And I just want to ask you a question. Have you ever had the thought come through your mind of this person close to you who you love, and you said in your mind, I'm going to kill him? Okay. Has that ever come across where they did something that just, (laughs) it just, yeah, you, you were ready to strangle somebody, and he's like, I know I told this joker not to do this, and here it is. I know he did it. He touched that. Whatever it is, I'm going to kill him, right? And it's just, it's just a thought. Now, remember, <laughs> thoughts are kind of like birds, right? You can't stop birds from flying over your head, but you can stop them from making a nest in your hair, right? I like, I like when I heard someone <laughs> say that. So you can't control the thought. So don't feel bad about the thought. I'm going to kill him, right? But... Uh, you know, sometimes you could even plan it out in your head a little bit. Just thoughts go by that quick, right? And you'd be like, okay, I'm just going to punch him in the throat. Whatever, whatever it is, you had this plan, you had this idea that lasts just a split second, and it's gone. What happens if you would actually say that out loud? You're in the same scenario that Jephthah's in. What if we said it out loud? Okay, we, we were upset we were, I understand we were in the moment, it was that, but God does not give a disclaimer for any of that. He just says, don't say it. 
refrain from making a vow, and you would not have sin on you. So again, the moral of this account, I think, when what we're, what we're looking at, to avoid the strange scenario, we just shouldn't be quick to promise or say the things that come to our head, the plans that all of a sudden are in our mind, not be quick to speak it. Proverbs 18, 21 says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Those who indulge in it will eat its fruit. Another one from Proverbs. We all are very familiar with this scripture, I'm sure. When words are many, sin is unavoidable. But he who restrains his lips is wise. When words are many, sin is not absent, is another translation. That one always boggled my mind. I never really understood what that meant. It's like, like if someone's up there, you know, giving a drosh, I mean, there's a lot of words up there. I mean, what are, what are we talking about? This is part of what Yeshua, or Hashem, is talking about. Okay, how about another question? What, I just got another one I want to look at. What if I don't promise to God, right? I don't, right now we've been reading, if you, if you vow a vow to Adonai, then this is the, then that's the, um, you know, criteria. Well, I think we find the answer for this one in the Ketavei Ashmachim in the New Testament with Ananias and Sapphira. Now, that's an interesting account. We, again, we are all very, very familiar with this account. And it's, it, we, we're going to start reading from, verse, from chapter 5, but this, this account actually starts in, ver, in chapter 4. Remember, this was not written in chapter and verse at first. Uh, and when we look up at chapter 4, we are reading about how the entire community was in one mind, one accord, and they, um, you know, they, they, nobody said anything was their own. So they would sell and, and give it to the emissaries. Uh, and then we get to Ananias and Sapphira, who decide to have a little plot to say, here's how much we're going to give, but we're, we're going to keep some back. All right, so that's the scenario. Now, Acts chapter 5, verse 3 says, But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, and keep back part of the proceeds of the land? Now, how would Peter have known this unless Ananias had said it? How would he have known what the intentions of Ananias was supposed to be or how much was supposed to be there unless Ananias and Sapphira had said something about it? Verse 4 says, while it remained unsold, Peter's continuing, he says, it was your own, wasn't it? And after it was sold, wasn't it at your disposal? How did this deed get into your heart? You haven't lied to men, but to God. And there it is. He says, you haven't lied to men, but to God. To God, even though he, Ananias and Sapphira, we could we could look at here. Seems like they were just trying to fool people and just said, "Okay, I'm just going to let people know what's going on." He said, "You didn't lie to men; you lied to God. God cares about the two most important things to God is our relationship with Him and our relationship with each other. If we do something to each other, that hurts God as well. We say it every week." Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and might, and then love your neighbor as yourself. Another verse I think would, would kind of put this argument to rest would be Colossians chapter 3, verse 23. It says, whatever you do, work at it from the soul as for the Lord and not for people. So in other words, everything we do, we should be doing it unto God. When we're at work, when we're talking to each other, when we're interacting with one another, how we treat one another, we should be doing it as if we were doing it to God. That's how it should be. So I want to start closing up. Everything comes down to to this point I want to make here. Now, statistically, you're only going to remember about 15% of whatever I say up here. So I want to make sure that this is part of that 15%. Right? which is why I'm talking about it more. And you're like, just get to the point, but I want to make sure the 15%, this is locked in. The whole point of this is reliability. Yeah. Hebrews 10, 23 says, let us hold fast the unwavering confession of hope for he who promised is faithful. Now that Greek word faithful is pitho, and that means uh, to convince or to rely. So again, this is like we said earlier. Like I said earlier, this is um, 
It says here to let us hold fast our unwavering confession of faith. The thing that we are able to hold on to with God, that we know that that expectation, that hope that he has and that he has promised us, we know that this is going to happen. It says, because for he who promised is faithful. The one who promised it, the one who vowed it, the one who said, this is what I'm going to do. We know we could trust it because he is faithful or reliable. We know we are able to rely on him. He's reliable. This is the same exact word used in Galatians 5. This is the uh, fruit of the Spirit. So in verse 22, it says, But the fruit of the Ruach is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. And Rabbi Shaul was telling us before this, he said, Run your lives by the Ruach, by the Spirit. This is how we're supposed to be running our lives. The fruit of the Spirit is how we should be conducting ourselves. In other words, the same faithfulness that God, that we rely on God for, and he has proven himself to us, is how we are supposed to be running our lives. We should be reliable people. Reliable people. Proverbs 25, 19 says, Relying on an untrustworthy person in a time of trouble is like relying on a broken tooth or an unsteady leg. That's not good. And again, the point is to, and I'm trying, I want to bring home is let's avoid just frivolously committing to things. We don't, we don't want to just, okay, yeah, I got that. Yeah, you got that from me. And again, it's, it's, it's in a habit, right? Just the other day, uh, I was talking to my brother and, um, and actually I went to my mom's house and my brother was there and he said, hey, yeah, thanks for calling me back. And then I forgot that I was talking to him on the phone as I was driving, and I said, hey, I got another call. I'll call you right back. And I never called him, right? Now, do I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm a huge sinner and all this? No, I mean, it was, it was an honest mistake. You know, I really didn't think, but we have to be thinking about this a little bit more. It's those little things like that. They can start off as a puddle like this in our lives and turn into a big flood. And that's what we need to, this is what we have to be careful on. This is why the scriptures teach us these things, so we don't become or get into the habit of being an unreliable person. So let us be intentional about our commitments, not for selfish gain or ambition, but so the faithfulness, the reliability of our God can shine through us, whom Yeshua said, we are the light of the world. I want to read one more passage of scripture that I think brings it home. But before I do, I just want to make this point. We need to be committed to commitment. Committed to commitment. And you're not making fickle plans or vows in the spur of the moment. We also need to remember to give each other a little bit of grace in this, like I talked about before. You know, I, I need it. We all need it. Give, us, give each other some grace. You know, we are all a work in progress. This doesn't mean that we don't ever plan or promise or commit to anything. There's nothing wrong with any of those as long as we conduct ourselves with integrity while we do it. If you aren't sure, simply don't say it. Keep your plan to yourself. Right? Just don't, don't promise it. Don't vow it. Because one day we are going to have to give an account. One day we will. And God is very clear in his word how he feels about this. So let's show our faith by our works not our good ideas. Let's show ourselves to be faithful, reliable, and mature. And let us not be impressed with a plan, but not even a good one. Instead, let us be impressed with our faithfulness. Let others be impressed with our faithfulness to God and to each other. I'd like to close off with a scripture that I think brings all this home. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verses 3. It says, When you swear a vow to God... Don't delay in fulfilling it. For he, who takes, for he takes no delight in fools. Pay what you vow. It is better for you not to vow than to vow and not pay. Don't let your mouth lead your flesh to sin. And don't say before the messenger, it was a mistake. Why should God be angry at your voice and destroy the work of your hands? Many dreams and many words are meaningless. Many dreams and many words are are meaningless. Therefore, fear God. Please stand. Let's pray. Vina Hashmaim. Oh, Heavenly Father, you know 
how messy your children are. You know that sometimes we say things, sometimes we, we promise things, sometimes we, and then we are forgetful people as well. That's not a good mix. But God, you have shown us grace. You have shown us mercy and compassion. And Lord, we ask that from you for this. Lord God, if, if we have a habit of, of making a vow and, and not doing it, or if we have made a vow and we have not kept it or an oath or something, Lord, forgive us. Let us have a clean, a fresh slate right now to move forward and grow and mature from this and know that we should be a reliable people, that the people on this planet should know that the body of Messiah are the most reliable people that they will ever meet. And Lord God, let us have this confidence in one another as we build and we work with each other to, to be the vessels that you have called us to be in every area, including and especially what comes out of our mouths. In Yeshua's name, amen. One of the saddest things that I read probably a couple of weeks ago was a guy that uh, served in Iraq. He recently married, and uh, while he was in Iraq, a bomb went off, and he lost like a leg and a part of you know a couple limbs. He came home, and his wife says, "No, this, the conditions changed. You know, it's not what I what I bargained for. You know, so I'm leaving." That's at the heart of what the brother's trying to communicate. We see it so often where people make commitments. But when then the conditions change, somehow we feel that, well, it's okay then. It's not what I, what I signed up for. No, commit to commitment. That's the word. Reliability. The brother's right. We have to be the most reliable people. We have to set the standard, the example of reliability. And if we're not, well, then we'd have no witness. Amen? Good word. Let's close. Yivarech Yahweh v'yishmarecho Z'adonai panavalecho v'yikonecho Z'adonai panavalecho Yisim lecha shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And I pray the Lord to lift his countenance upon you and that he would grant you his shalom, his peace. B'shem Yeshu Adonai. Do you agree? Amen. Amen. Receive it. Amen.